Hey, and welcome to this bonus episode of the Keyboard Chronicles, a podcast for keyboard players of the gigging variety. Um, it's great to be here with you and, and uh, great to have you on board as always, Paul. Yes, a pleasure to be here and I'm very excited about what we're about to discuss. Yeah, absolutely. So this is a bonus episode um, for our patrons uh, who we value a great deal for your support in keeping the podcast going. Cannot thank you enough. And and as promised, you know, a few times a year, we hope to bring some bonus content to you. To, um, it's the least we can do. So um, this episode, we're talking to uh, Mr. Josh Weinstein, um, and he appeared on episode 35 of the main show. Uh, but we're talking to him here specifically about his love of Pink Floyd and working in a Pink Floyd tribute act called Pink Floyd. Uh, and as you know, my valued co-host Paul also um, plays in a tribute act, Echoes of Pink Floyd. Um, definitely, whether you're in the US or Australia, definitely get to see um, either of those acts. Um, so yeah, we, we, we talk everything Pink Floyd with Josh, so I hope you enjoy that. And also want to give a special shout out to um, our patron, Greg Chance, uh, who runs the brilliant Core Chrome users group on Facebook. If you use the Core Chrome or, or any close relative of it, which I don't think there are any, Paul, is it? I mean, you know, they, they're all related. Um, Greg, the community Greg's built there is brilliant and, and well worth a check out. And thank you for your ongoing support, Greg. Enjoy the interview. All right, Josh, we're back. This is the the bonus episode. You're the first cab off the rank for a bonus. That's just how worthy you are. Um, and we've got a great, great topic, which is uh, Pink Floyd's music and and uh, trying to replicate that in a live context as a uh-huh. as a musician. Because I believe two out of three people on this podcast have vast experience doing so. So uh, I think uh, I, one has vast experience and one just has experience. Paul is is way ahead of me on that one. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's start off, uh, Josh, with maybe talking about how you got involved playing um, Pink Floyd stuff. Uh, with this project, um, the the group is called uh, Pink Floyd or or Pink Floyd Experience (PFX). It's the same same group. I, I don't. I'm still not completely clear on the distinction. <laughs> I think one of them is their full stage show with the. Um, you know, with the movies and the lights and the other one is you get to hire the same guys and, and, um, you know, we don't put on the same stage show, but we play the same songs the same way. So I think that's Mm -hmm. the distinction, but, uh, they, um, they were hired to tour, uh, before the pandemic. So 2019, uh, to tour Canada and the U S with, uh, foreigner and, um, a few of the, a couple of the folks that I play with were hired on for the tour. A singer that I do, uh, you know, pre-pandemic did probably 50 dates a year with, uh, and a sax player who I probably did 25 or 30 dates a year with were both hired onto that tour. And um, uh, at the end of the tour, some of the personnel had maybe had enough of each other, and there was a, an opportunity to bring in a, a different keyboard player, and so they they recommended. Uh, me for that for that position brilliant um (laughs) and so and and so can you share more broadly your relationship with pink floyd as a listener and as a musician like is it was it a natural fit that you go yeah i definitely want to be part of this and i've always loved their music it was absolutely that um, I, uh, Pink Floyd is the, is probably the group I had. Oh, that's, that's, this is a bonus, right? So this is separate from the, yeah, yeah. you and I have previously talked about that feeling of putting on headphones and just not being able to wait for what sounds were going to come next and being sort of mystified by how deep the sounds went. And in, in my head, when I said that to you, Pink Floyd was mm. almost certainly who I was describing as a kid listening to records that way. Um, Mm -hmm. and you know, uh, by the time, um, you know, the wall came out, that was me walking downtown alone with my allowance money to get it the first day it came out and just sitting, listening to it over and over and over again. Uh, um, you know, making narrative out of it and listening into those great sounds. And so I'd, I'd come in earlier, but I was, I was younger. I'd heard dark side and wish you were here and I'd heard animals um, uh, uh, from like from rock loving friends, 
But the first one that I walked downtown myself to the record store and bought and listened to beginning to end was The Wall. And then I went backwards and realized the depth of the group. Uh, so, yeah, they were they were a huge part of my soundtrack growing up. There's still how I think about how records should sound. There's still things that Pink Floyd did that I heard as a kid that, as far as I'm concerned, that's that's what a record should sound like even now in 2021. Mm. Yeah. Mm, certainly. Can you recall, Josh, what, what was your initial reaction when you first heard The Wall? What, what, what did – how did you feel about that when you first heard it? Uh, it was almost um, – uh, how do I describe this? I I almost needed a minute, <laughs> you know, like mm-hmm. uh, once I figured out what was happening with this record that that, you know, that that we, you just sort of had to sign on and and go along with it. Mm-hmm. I, I had to recalibrate. Um, I don't, there's a there's a phrase I want to use and I'm not sure I had to sort of reckon with it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I remember it being being um, uh more than I had considered I was going to get from a record. And I remember it having to sort of reckon with it and, and re recalibrate how I dealt with sound I was getting. And really it's such a visual record. Uh, and listen, so you, you've heard, you've heard, you know, my stuff, you, you hear, uh, um, out, outside sounds on anything I do. I always hear, I hear like a movie when I try to put a song together, uh-huh. I am a hundred percent certain that's because of the wall. That's because okay. that's be, that's mm-hmm. and and then and then Pink Floyd in general. That that's because that made the idea that a, an album could be a movie seem reasonable. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Yeah, th- thank you for sharing that. In your view, you know, you've talked about how the the music. You know, in your opinion, this is how albums should still sound and what music should still sound like. Is is it that that you believe that's made the music so enduringly popular? Like you know, globally, or, or are there other elements as well that you think have made it so yeah. successful? Interesting. So I just want to clarify because I'm not a nostalgist, meaning I'm totally happy with the next great sound I hear. I'm not like albums mm. should still sound like Pink Floyd. What I mean is there are elements in their sound that I that still would please me if they were in sounds now. And that's sure. not true. That's not true about everything. You know, lots of stuff, lots of stuff that people our age glorify sounds really damn dated 50, 40, yeah. 50 years later, yeah, you know, great. and nobody, nobody needs to keep hearing this, you know, we're done. Transistor organs, you're cute. That's fine. But you know, it <laughs> sounds like, you know, it, it sounds like when it's from, you know, mm-hmm. uh, or sitar, right. You know, that sounds yeah. like a, 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 a particular point in time where that was, you know, that was what that was modern and that was a long time ago. It's not modern anymore. Yeah. Um, what makes Pink Floyd so enduring? Partially it's that um, it's that not locked in time aspect. I guess, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm sort of I guess I'm sort of starting halfway through their story when I say this, because I, I think some of the I think some of the, um, you know, late 60s stuff probably does have a little bit of of, you know, late 60s on it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think coming in with like Dark Side of the Moon, uh, uh, that, that whole stretch, you know, from 73 up to, you know, to the end of the 70s to 79, where where the the records didn't feel like they were made in rooms. And maybe that's mm-hmm. what it is. They're not located somewhere. You don't get the sense of people sitting around playing these songs. You get the sense of them sort of existing. They don't, they don't sound located. Um, they, they sound, they sound larger than yeah. a, a room would be. And maybe that's yep. what makes them last. If that makes sense. Makes a hundred percent sense. Yeah. From the philosophical to the practical, I'm, I'm curious, what is the rehearsal routine process for your band? And you know, are you rehearsing at present for, for anything uh, at the moment? We are. In fact, we are uh, the first group into a, a venue downtown. Uh, we're playing this Thursday, which is their first night back. Oh, it's a large venue downtown. If, if awesome. it's standing room, I think it's uh, 800. And, I mean, not, not you guys play theaters, right? This is a, this is a, uh, you know, a performance hall. Sure. Um, I think if it's standing room, it's 800, but if it's sitting, it's less, but it's, um, you know, it's an, it's a nice venue. It's a warm up for a festival that we're going to headline later in the summer. And so that answers part of your question, which is, 
we have a festival coming up, so we booked a warm up gig. That's one of yeah. our rehearsal routines. Right. And then, um, uh, yeah, we're rehearsing uh, two days from now, Tuesday. Well, uh, Wednesday for you uh, uh, of this week. We rehearsed last week. Mostly it's, um, you know, trusting everyone to learn parts on their own and then getting together to make sure the show flows and parts mm -hmm. are there and that I'm, I'm triggering samples where they should happen. And mm -hmm. uh, harmonies are a big part of the approach of this group. Out of the seven or eight on stage, there are seven or eight singers. Every person on stage sings. And so we spent a lot of time. We did a mm -hmm. separate vocal rehearsal, uh, signed yep. parts, ran through. Yeah, I mean, like like everyone, we don't do you know we don't do weekly rehearsals if that's the question. We tend to rehearse for uh, you know four shows. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And I imagine, I imagine Josh, like your solo career, is just pretty much like along a Nord stage, and that'll do you, wouldn't it? For Pink Floyd, there's not much complexity. <laughs> in this stuff, I'm not even bringing the Nord stage. I'm just going to describe <laughs> the parts. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I'm doing a new thing. I'm doing a new thing where I'm just. I'm going to see how accurate I can get linguistically. And oh, uh, good. Yeah. Yeah. No, so, uh, I mean, what's your rig? Yeah, what's your rig for that, Josh? Because that's obviously a, a much different kettle of fish. It's it's actually the reason that I went with the FA6 as my second board because it's a a sampler, a sequencer, and a and a workstation synth and. I have used other, I've used uh, all three of those. I've used a synth plus a sampler plus a sequencer for, for Pink Floyd gigs and then ended up uh, consolidating. And, and believe it or not, I do the Pink Floyd as a two board gig. All, this, all the samples live in the FAO 6. Mm -hmm. um, I have the two boards talk to each other one direction or another so that if I want a layered sound, you know, maybe I'll send it from one and then leave the local volume up on the other. Um, I, I do the entire show, believe it or not, with the two boards, with the Nord and the FA6 yeah. and, the, and the, sample, the samples live in the FA6. Even the sequence for like on the run, you know, that's all that's in there. So, and Paul, I'm yeah. going to put you on the spot. Yeah, I, I believe you have a two board rig. So, how how do you do yours the same or differently? Or uh, yeah, not not for Floyd David. I have three. I have so three. I'm not, Sorry, I'm yeah. not as clever as Josh. Yeah, so I've got a, a, a stage piano. Uh, the Korg Chrome sits above it, which is a that's my all in one kind of do everything board. And then yep. I've got the King the King Korg to do the synth stuff. Uh, uh, but right. but then I also have a an iPad which runs the sample. So it's almost like a four board rig because I don't have the the ability the FAO six does to, to play the samples right. live. So uh, Josh wins the efficiency prize by yeah. mile. <laughs> I mean, we'll see. There, there's a couple. There's a couple compromises that I haven't. I haven't quite worked out. Um, I mean, I, well, no. Let me say that. Let me say that differently. I have worked it out. I haven't paid for the price for the contrivance that, that it's that it's. It hasn't gone wrong yet. But there's been a couple compromises I've done. Where I really have to make sure I'm on the ball to, you know, to get from a sample to a, you know, maybe a mod wheel switch to an expression pedal switch. Gotcha. And so far, so far, I haven't run that train into a wall, but uh, <laughs> I, I'm hoping to make some adjustments before I do, because there is it's a keyboard. It's it's um, counterintuitively a, a keyboard band. Yeah. Most people don't think of, you know, Richard Wright as Pink Floyd. They, you know, they think of him as the guy playing keyboards. But. It is. It is a. It is a hundred percent. Paul, do you find this? It's. It's yes. the engine of the band is the keyboards. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Josh. And and I wonder why so many. Um, you know, you mentioned before about when when David asked you Pink Floyd. Yeah, I'd love to do that. And and I felt exactly the same way. And I, and it's, it's because I think we understand as keyboard players, it's such a keyboard heavy band. But maybe the casual listener thinks more about the David Gilmore guitar solos and that sort of stuff. Absolutely. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and that's that's one of those cases where sticking your head in the monitor and really listening through reveals, you know, how many of those layers are uh, are keyboard layers, or at least if you want to do them live. You know, correct. Have, that's yeah. right. And yeah, so, totally agree. And you probably already answered this to a large extent, Josh, but with the 80s and 90s Pink Floyd material, it did rely heavily on studio production for those, you know, big lush soundscapes. <laughs> so how do you tackle the challenge of that? It's basically the samples and, and what you do with your, your current boards? Yes, um, that's actually easier because it, uh, there's a, there's a kind of balance between uh, authenticity and and performativity, and the the struggle lightens a bit in the '80s and '90s because we were off those those um, iconic studio sounds mm -hmm. and into a little more of a of a performance band, and so. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, um, are a, a nice lush synth pad answers the desire for the listener to hear a lush synth, synth pad there without, you know, maybe what, what we might otherwise nerd out on, which is what year was the roads on this, you know, on this record or, you know, mm-hmm. was, uh, and so, uh, yeah, it's, it actually is a little bit easier as the synths are more like they are now than, well, I don't know what, if you find that Paul, but I, I do, I find the, the more recent stuff easier to pull off. Yeah, it, it's. Uh, I would 100% support what you said in in the sense that um, yeah, a lush sounds a lush sound, and yeah. I, I don't know, Josh. Do you find yourself with with certain parts just having to make a decision because it's just not physically possible on a keyboard <laughs> to cover everything that's going on and say, yeah, well, what's what's the bit that the audience will want to hear here to almost fool them into thinking it's exactly like the record? Is is that your experience? Yeah, all all the time, all the time, except. Um... I'm I'm a little bit OCD, and so if there's any way that I that I'm going to make it happen, I'm probably I'm, I'm probably going to not I'm probably not going to throw out the ballast. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the flip side of that is, uh, I'm happy to say that you know the band leader for this group, his his interest is not always in capturing the album unless we're playing the album so we as you do you know sometimes we'll play through an, an album top to bottom mm-hmm. in that case our our goal is is to is to be completely ocd about replicating it in most cases he he's more interested in h- how the performance is going to get pulled off live so he'll send us yeah. off to pulse or delicate sound of thunder or some of the live you know some of the live uh albums uh for reference and really what that uh, and with the instruction of this is feeling kind of bare here, you know, just stick organ on the back of that. Let's let's make some energy happen behind that. He had organ on this tour. There was uh-huh. organ live. We're not going to worry about the fact that it wasn't organ on the original track for this. And that's actually a little bit freeing when we're not playing through albums, uh, you know, song track by track. Yeah, yeah, cool. Very cool. I'm, I'm also interested in you and you allude to this right at the start. Josh, when you said the band almost has two iterations from a visual presentation point of view, but I am interested in how you approach the visual aspect of bringing a live Floyd performance to the stage. Um, we are dudes in a Pink Floyd band, and the the uh, visuals are carried behind us on screen. And aside from that, mm-hmm. uh, the music the music mostly does the talking. We do mm-hmm. not go to we do not go to performance videos and and enact the the concerts uh if yeah. that's what you mean we do have it is multimedia uh, as yours is we do have a screen behind us and um mm-hmm. you know and on the big show there's a light show and 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 more as i as i think you you do maybe even more so probably more so than we do but uh from a stage presentation standpoint um we are we are not replicating we are not pretending to be pink floyd literally. you're not dressing up in a week I'm not in a wig. That's exactly right. We are yeah. we are the dudes playing this music, and the music is Pink Floyd, and we're the guys playing the music. Yeah, wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, I'm, I'm curious too, and this is just because uh, you're obviously in the, in the states. Uh, interested in what music or which songs or which era of Pink Floyd your audiences are most attractive to or, or most responsive to when you play? Um, that that sweet spot in the seventies. The the uh, dark side, which you're here, animals, the wall. Mm-hmm. That's that's the almost the entirety of the of the set list. Mm-hmm. And some Sid stuff, you know, astronomy. But uh, yeah, that's 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 the bulk of the list. How about you guys? Uh, I would say very similar. Although there is a bit of a bent towards the 1980s stuff, the the momentary lap stuff. Mm. Uh, uh, they were, right. They they charted fairly well in Australia with learning to fly. Yeah, and yeah, we so, do, so, uh, and, yeah. uh, and I, was, I was just about to say that we actually do learning to fly. That is, uh, we do momentary laps uh, for that. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. But yeah. but it's but it's very similar. Uh, and, you know, not that it's a bit indulgent for me to say this, but my my personal preference sits in that seventy three to seventy nine era as well. So I think um, that sometimes informs what you play if you love it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think so. Yeah. Uh, let's see what, what else we do. One of these days. Uh, yeah, no, it's it's mostly the sweet spot. I'm just trying to look at our set list. It's actually right next to me. So for this show, um, Sorrow, Astronomy, and the uh, Learning to Fly isn't on this set. So most the rest of it is all in that little sweet spot. Okay. Yeah, cool. And would that be cool. your personal preference sweet spot as well, Josh, as far as your own personal favorite Floyd material? Uh, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. 
those those are the ones to me that that have that sense of not being anywhere, just being almost like you'd. You know, it's the soundtrack to if you get launched into space. That's what you expect to hear. You know, coming by you in the in the spaceship going in the other direction. It feels uh, it feels unlocated for me, and that's that's the that's the era where I think they were making albums that had that nature. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I always feel that way about Dark Side of the Moon. I, I can't believe how strongly that stands up from a production and listening experience point of view, given that it was released in 1973. Uh, abs- absolutely, a hundred percent. And um, yeah, that's 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 what I mean. It's it's uh, it is in time. It is uh, what forty odd fifty, I guess, years ago. Uh, wow, that's felt bad to say that, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, um, but it you. I, I feel about it the way that I often feel when I teach, for example, Romantic era composers. You know, to students who haven't heard heard them, mm-hmm. that's the era where you get that you're hearing a particular genre of music. But if I told you this was the soundtrack to Star Wars this year that somebody composed, you wouldn't fight me on it. You wouldn't say, "Oh, I think they wrote in an old fashioned style." Yeah, yeah. Because it doesn't feel grounded in an era, and that's how this feels to me too. Mm-hmm. It might be, you know, it might be a particular style. But if you told me somebody came out with this this year, I'd I'd believe you. I I wouldn't think it would get air- airplay. But I, I would believe you that it came out, you know, now for sure. Yeah. T- taking that idea a step further, Josh, do you get many younger people coming to your shows? A ton. My daughter, two rooms away right now, has a Dark Side of the Moon t- T-shirt in her room that I didn't that I didn't impose, you know, on, on well, her. You may, you may not have imposed it, but I'm still choosing to call that good parenting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, a, a ton. It it does hold up. If you're a rocker at all. This is sort of the iconic, uh, this is the mother load, you know. This is where all the ideas came from, I think, that that um, that most folks listen to if they listen to rock. And I, I think that, I think the two degrees of separation uh, is pretty readily apparent to most listeners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. cool, cool. Um, How about you? Now, uh, yeah, I, uh, it's interesting. We our, our audience is predominantly in the the boomer generation, which makes perfect sense when you think yep. of the vintage of the music. But yeah, we, we get we get younger people come to the shows too, and I'm always delighted when I, you know, someone might have brought their daughter along or, or their granddaughter yeah. or grandson, and, and when when they approach us and say oh, it's my first ever concert, you know, it's very humbling, and you know, to, just to hear they enjoyed it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. or, although, like you, Josh, we don't get too caught up in our role in it because we are just people playing um uh, I, i'm going to steal a phrase that you used in our, our main podcast other people's original music i love that i'm going to steal that it's fantastic mm. <laughs> so. um do you find that people have a strong opinion of hardcore fans that you meet on waters versus gilmore because i i encounter that a bit and i'm curious if that's your experience as well and, and if you do what's your view on it I, I get to stay out of that um, <laughs> that conversation. We are very Gilmore uh, skewed um, in this in this group because the guitar player uh, has a preference for that, and he's actually talked about it. So, mm-hmm. <clears throat> uh, but I I am not uh, just about never part of those conversations. So I I suppose that's a cop out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I I I don't. I, I actually the, no. The direct answer is no. I haven't had that conversation at a gig. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah cool. Well, I reckon um, I'm I'm all done with Pink Floyd questions, Dave. So uh, yeah, I think, I think they're a bit I'm of an overrated band. Josh, a bit of an overrated Josh has been, band. A, Josh has been very generous with his time too, so I don't want to keep you no, forever, mate. But, I would have uh, been more happy talking. I don't know, Taylor Swift or I don't know something like that. But anyway, hey, but, Josh loves Taylor Swift. Don't well, she's uh, a le- she. Look, you got to respect her, or do you, Josh? Maybe you don't. Anyway, let's not go there. I I do, and I started a minor flame war on my uh, social media feed by saying so. Yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, I did. I, I I said, you know, whatever, say what you want, but you, no denying, she's talented. Jeez. She plays good guitar. She writes songs. You know, she's a good producer. Uh, she's you know, she's what's going to be next. 
And I, I made uh, old people very uncomfortable when, <laughs> when I said that. There's still one guy who follows me around on social media thinking he's trolling me by reminding me of it. And I'm like, I completely agree with myself. She that's is. right. That's she right. Is. You're not, this is not trolling me. I'm, I'm agreeing right now with what you said I said. No, that's gold. <laughs> No, thank you, Josh. It's been a pleasure talking with you again. And um, yeah, can't can't thank you enough for taking the time. And yeah, let's give you some of your life back and um, we'll definitely talk soon. No, I appreciate you having me. Thank you very much for reaching out. Good to talk with both of you. And so there we have, we've wrapped our first bonus episode. Paul, um, is it fair to say you enjoyed that discussion? Oh, it was great fun. I, I, you know, I was really looking forward to it, and having followed Josh, you know, casually via the music forum and, and online, and checked out his band a little bit online too. They're, they're really good, and it's just always fun to talk about something you're passionate about. And he's a great guy too, so a lot of fun. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I uh, really appreciate Josh's involvement and it just makes you realise how keen you are to get all of us in a room at some stage to have a good old natter. We need a real-world catch-up. So true. Uh, so, no, thanks, everyone, for joining us for this bonus episode and um, hope you continue to enjoy both the ongoing uh, extra content and the main episodes themselves and we'll catch up with you soon. Mm-hmm.